So, uh, we all communicate with natural language, and we all walk around in a visual world. So, if we really care about artificial intelligence, we better build algorithms that understand language as well as visual inputs, and ideally combine the two. So, let's start with a very simple kind of natural language processing problem, which we all uh, encounter a lot in our daily lives, or uh, especially if you're a company, you care a lot about uh, understanding sentiment uh, of your customers, for instance, on Twitter. So here we have uh, a new kind of algorithm. It's called a recursive neural network algorithm, which is essentially much more accurate than what is commonly used right now in industry. Most people in industry will just take all the words in a sentence or a tweet or a document and sum them up and ignore their order. They just say, oh, we have all these positive words here. We sum them up. We have a bunch of negative words here. Maybe we subtract them with some weights. And then we say, overall, this sentence is positive or negative, depending on how many positive words we've, we've seen in that sentence. Of course, that can be problematic. So here's a very simple example, not a good movie. So good movie is positive, but not a good movie is negative. OK, you might say, well, I could write maybe a simple regular expression uh, where I just say, whenever I see not, followed by a positive word, I make it very negative. But it's also not quite true because not a fantastic movie. It might still be a neutral movie. It's not you know, one of the best ones, but it doesn't mean it's a really terrible one. So we can look at a couple of other kinds of examples and really see where we need more sophisticated understanding of the algorithms. So here we have a problem with resizing a browser window. All right. So here we say, the first three minutes were boring, but by the end, I really enjoyed the talk. So here, what we see is an X but Y construction, and but is a contrastive conjunction. And really, what we would like the algorithm to learn is that when I say something negative in the beginning or something positive, and then I contrast it with something afterwards, then what should come afterwards actually matters more pragmatically when I try to convey my sentiment. And here, the recursive neural network algorithm essentially understands the grammatical structure, and then from the grammatical structure, understands how the words are being put together and you know, form the overall sentiment of the sentence. And so in the end, the algorithm learns that this is indeed a positive sentence. And this can go as far as you know, examples where we basically only have uh, negative or only have positive words and yet have an overall uh, negative sentence. So here we have the sentence, despite the wonderful reviews, I can say that this was, wasn't a particularly great experience. So deep learning will essentially allow us to move beyond the so-called bag of words, just throwing all the words that we have into a bag and ignoring the word order. It can really understand compositionality, how, do words are put to, how are words put together to form the meaning of longer phrases in a more principled way. Of course, sentiment, you could say, is a rather simple task. So let's look at another harder task, namely question answering. So in, this is actually the first iteration of models. We're now working on some even better ones. But here, what we're trying to do is basically predict quiz bowl answers. So quiz bowl is a competition not, uh, diff not too different from Jeopardy, but you know, played in the high school and college level. It's basically a trivia competition. How many trivial facts do you know about different historical figures or books you've read or you know, wars and all kinds of different events? And you want to, you know, after reading the question, know what the answer is. So does anybody know here who has you know, left and finished a novel whose title character forges his father's signature and so on? Yes. Very good. We have a very educated crowd here. The answer is Thomas Mann. And so in this competition, you basically get a bunch of facts. In the beginning, they're more and more trivial. And towards the end, you say, all right, it's a German author, and he wrote Magic Mountain. So as this algorithm has to compete with humans, basically, as soon as a human read the first sentence, if they have actually read all the books, they can buzz in and then you know, give the answer. So how do we solve this problem? It turns out we can use the same exact recursive neural network that we've used for understanding sentiment. But now, instead of training the algorithm to predict whether the sentence is positive or negative, we try to train the algorithm 
to say these facts that I'm reading in the sentence form something that should go close to the answer. So in this case, we ideally train that all these various facts here lead us to a specific type of answer. So this is, could be very useful if you have, for instance, a large knowledge base, you have a lot of incoming customer email, and you want to ideally automatically answer a lot of that email. Once you've seen a certain question a couple hundred times, which large companies very quickly do, you can then automatically assign the right answer in your knowledge base to it. Here's a visualization of what happens as you train this algorithm on a bunch of characters in history. So you can see, for instance, that George Washington and uh, Thomas Jefferson, early United States presidents, have similar vector representations. Of course, these vectors are usually hundreds of dimensions, and here we project them down to two dimensions just to understand what happens in the algorithm. And what we see here is that, indeed, similar kinds of facts are being mapped to similar areas in this vector space. So the algorithm learns how to instill knowledge just from seeing a bunch of examples of questions and answers into specific entities. And what's amazing is that in some cases, for some kinds of competitions, uh, the algorithm can actually even win against people. And so you might say, well, I've seen that in Jeopardy, and you know, IBM's Watson system was also able to beat humans, uh, and not just college students, but you know, the best humans in the world uh, in Jeopardy. The difference here is this was one graduate student, Mohit Ear, uh, working for two or three months using deep learning, versus a team that spent hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, hundreds of people, several years, to, to get to that similar kind of stage. So the, the power here is that the student didn't have to engineer specific features and say, well, if I have Thomas Mann, then if, whenever I see these kinds of words, then this is probably the right answer. And you know, maybe I will do a lot of string matching between the question and all the different kinds of books that we've read about Thomas Mann and the Wikipedia page and so on. But it actually allowed the algorithm to learn these kinds of features and learn what matters by itself just from seeing a bunch of question and answering pairs. Of course, that doesn't always work. So for instance, for literature competitions, the model still uh, only wins like two thir uh, loses two thirds of the games uh, compared to a human. Of course, the problem here was that the algorithm didn't actually have access to the actual books. Uh, it only had access to the question answer pairs and eventually also to a bunch of Wikipedia articles. But those of Thomas Mann don't necessarily mention all the plot lines. So there's still a lot of extra work that can be done and I think eventually the algorithm will probably beat humans just like the IBM uh, Watson system more consistently. So the two first, the first two tasks I just mentioned, sentiment analysis and question answering systems, were basically only looking at text. But as we walk around, as we learn uh, you know, as humans about natural language, a lot of that learning is visual. And so it turns out we can again use that same recursive neural network I talked about that we use for sentiment analysis, that we use for question answering. We can use that same neural network to map sentences into the same vector space as images. So here we have images, and we look at only the pixels of those images, and we map them using a so-called convolutional neural network, a sort of the de facto standard in computer vision now. We use a convolutional neural network to map the sentences into a vector space, sorry, the, the map the images into a vector space, and then we use a recursive neural network to map the same uh, sentences describing now these images into the vector space. And then ideally we train the model such that sentences that describe a specific image actually have a similar vector in the end. So here we have a man wearing a helmet jumps on his bike near a beach, and we map that whole sentence, not just the single words, and again, not ignoring the word order, but mapping the entire sentence compositionally to this representation, which is now grounded. It has some meaning in our visual world. So what does that look like in a live demo? So here we basically trained the algorithm with a bunch of examples where it had five sentences describing each image. And then after seeing a lot of examples, we can now query the model on a test set and see how well it captured different phenomena. So here we type bird, 
and it shows us pictures of single birds. And again, it just looks at the pixels. So Google Image Search, for instance, looks at mostly the text surrounding the image, not uh, the actual image itself. So here, just from looking at a bunch of pixels, we map the image to the vector space, and then the proximity to the text box basically shows you the proximity in this high-dimensional vector space. Again, it's not just two-dimensional. It'll be 100-dimensional, but we project it down to two. So for BERT, you might say, well, we've seen that a lot, right? General image classification can give us a single category. But what's neat here is we can say birds in plural, and now it actually shows us pictures of multiple birds. So it had you know, some sense of plurality of having multiple objects in the image. And we can now move beyond just single words and actually say, you know, let's combine words and say birds on water. And now it actually pulls out only those birds that are on water if it has such images. We can say birds and trees, and it will try to find the pictures of birds and trees. And it works for a lot of different kinds of categories. We have your baby, for instance, or you have lots of different kinds of baby pictures, or baby with mother, where we see mostly pictures of uh, women with their baby together. Uh, we can also look for horse. So lots of different kinds of categories. And in some cases, we can even pull out very specific images. So here we have horse with bald man. And it actually turns out it pulls out the one image in the data set where there's a bald man next to a horse. And what's also interesting is the other errors or you know, sort of similar images that it pulls out are people wearing helmets, which you know, to a model that has only seen so many images in its lives might look like they're bald too. They're just white helmets, though. So it's not perfect. And I think the other direction is even harder, trying to generate these sentence descriptions from images. But that is also possible with deep learning. So now, you might say, all right, those are fun applications. But what about real applications that I care about when I try to do, for instance, a social media campaign? And I really try to understand how my users will react to certain content that I put out. Uh, to show you the power of this technology in a real life setting here, we actually trained a model to not just predict uh, whether you, know, you describe something, because most people will understand, OK, well, I, can, I can describe here what I see. But what you might not be able to do is go through a billion uh, social media messages from Facebook or Twitter and then see what actually comes out of the algorithm such that uh, the algorithm tells you whether your tweet is actually engaging. Will people actually click on this tweet or ignore it. And what we did here is essentially train such a system. And we looked at uh, a bunch of tweets and, and social media messages. And now we can ask the algorithm, do you think before I send this tweet out, will it create a lot of clicks, favorites, retweets, and likes, and so on? And it turns out this, text, uh, this tweet here, for instance, is uh, take a closer look at the world of Tomorrowland. People don't like to be told what to do on Twitter. This is an interesting insight. So take a closer look, go for a walk. You've got to see this area. People don't necessarily like to be told what to do. However, this image here is very engaging. And we can even ask the model, why do you think it's engaging? And well, it turns out the algorithm actually, and I've observed this now, likes uh, blonde hair in, in the wind a little bit and in the background. And it thinks these buildings here are quite cool. And we can look at other examples. So this one here, for instance, was not very engaging. And it indeed was. This is a, you know, a random tweet I just pulled out this morning uh, about a big fat creek wedding, which just talked about it making you know, 50 times more than the movie was worth. And nobody really cares about how much an old movie was worth when it was made versus you know, how much money it made. And so here, I, I pulled out another example from this morning about Mad Max. And that one, indeed, got a lot of favorites and likes. So I put it into this model. And indeed, it would have predicted this correctly. It understands that this is, indeed, a very engaging picture that you could put together with your tweet. And the nice thing is, this is interactive. I could now type in a tweet. And before I send it out, essentially have a little bit of an A-B test. I'm like, oh, this phrase will not resonate well. Maybe I'll rephrase this one a little bit. Maybe I crop the picture. Maybe I choose you know, one of five different pictures and so on. And here, of course, we see that you know, cool cars and action figures and so on 
are very helpful. So to basically wrap up, uh, these are some of the applications that we very quickly built ourselves at MetaMind uh, to, to solve specific problems. But what we're really trying to do is give you AI uh, technology and have you be able to build your own applications. So we basically put out this general image classifier that you can very easily use with just three lines of Python code to predict one of many thousands of categories. If you're more interested in specific applications, we can also build one for your uh, for instance, we have, we're approached by a bunch of people who try to classify different food items, and we can do that as well. Of course, the most exciting part for me personally is that you, we let you train your own classifier. So maybe you want to build a not safe for work classifier or a you know, convertible versus you know, normal car classifier. And all you need to do to do this is either drag and drop a bunch of images into your browser or use a very simple API where with you know, around 10 lines of Python code, you can just send thousands or millions of images to the API and train your very own deep learning system. And this works for both images and text. So to conclude, basically, deep learning is a very powerful technology that allows you to learn both compositional and grounded representations to solve real-world tasks. And this combination can really be employed in a variety of different tasks that both require world and visual knowledge. And this is essentially what is driving our, uh, our work as, as MetaMind's vision, which is breakthrough AI for everyone. And uh, for those of you familiar with the field, in two weeks there will be actually be the NIPS paper deadline. So in three weeks or so, we'll put out uh, some even more breakthrough results in this area. Thank you.